Hey, America! It's me again! I hate to do this because I know how busy you are. You just got under new management and some of your beneficiaries are unhappy with the current shift in power and so you're dealing with the recent fallout and their rioters. But do you remember the time that you separated me from my friends and family, stripped off my humanity, dressed me in shackles, told yourself that it's fine to make me property, said I'm not like you, I'm beneath you, there's an order to things, this is the way of God, made me worship that same God you said made me not worthy of my own autonomy, that my anatomy is built for profit, built me to be owned for slavery, for cotton picking, cuz I remember and how I raised your children on those cotton fields and those children owned me and my children and my children's children. And then I got people thinking that maybe owning people was wrong and maybe I should be free, and part of this country was like, sure. And then the president was told that if he didn't emancipate us, that he wouldn't be president again. And he was like, okay, fine, because he really wanted to be president again. And then there was a war, because part of this country didn't want to be part of the country where I couldn't be property, and they lost that war that I fought in, but kept their flag as a reminder that I should be property, and even though I was free, some still kept me, and some said they were sorry, and you said you were sorry, and even though as a product I was worth about three billion dollars, and even though the cotton I picked was worth about 250 million dollars, you promised in writing I could have the 400,000 acres confiscated from those that lost the war, plus their mules. And that was cool, that was cool, but then that president got shot, and then the vice president became president and felt bad for all those people who lost me as property. So he gave my promise, 40 acres and a mule, to those same people who enslaved me? Well... I've been thinking, are you planning on keeping that promise? Because I know you're busy playing cleanup and there's so much to clean up. But remember that time I was experimented on for the advancement of medicine and how my body was the foundation of gynecological health breakthroughs because slave owners saw the benefit of ensuring that I could keep producing healthy product because what's better than product making product, right? And you know how basically I emancipated myself but then went back to work at those same factories of trauma as a sharecropper because that was the only work I could get but I couldn't spend the little money I earned everywhere or live everywhere or look everywhere or breathe everywhere or just breathe and how the people that you employed to hunt me down if I escaped bondage became the foundation of the police forces that allowed me to be beaten and burned and whipped and raped and lynched and yet I died first in your revolution and fought in your wars for your glory and your honor and then when I came back from dying for your ego overseas I came back to being beaten, burned, whipped, raped, lynched and you burned my towns like Rosewood or just placed me in communities where I once again became a profitable outlet like for cocaine, the same cocaine that was used to make me more productive as a worker on the docks in New Orleans. I became a user of and incarcerated for by police who chased me in jails I feel that are privately owned that make money that keep you rich while I say poor I'm just wondering do you plan on paying me back anytime soon because I know you don't have time to look at the many corners of your oppression, and there are many. But remember how I made music, but wasn't allowed to make money off my music, but you were, and you sang my songs, and danced to my words, but hated my soul, because if you didn't, you'd hate yourself for what you did to me, and blamed me for how I hurt so much, and I've been hurt so 
so much that sometimes all I know how to do is hurt myself and how I tried to rise above it, fighting just for equality, just for civility, but you kept killing me for just speaking about civility and how equality would be great and how I wasn't allowed to be great, so you wore my skin and my shade on screen to prevent my greatness, and yet I still found a way to show my greatness in your shade and my magic and my grace and my style and my brilliance became the foundation of your cool and makes you money that you make on other lands that you hate and speaking of that money it's a lot and I know that maybe you don't remember all of this because you gave native people that you killed some lands and you gave some Japanese Americans that you had fought in your second war some money and you gave some Jews that you saved some money that you think that you don't have any more money. But I just checked my bank statement and my records and um, history and I see I've been steadily still making you the most money since you brought me here that has only earned interest and I have so much interest in how your inheritors can drop out of high school and make more than me after I finish college what and then I'll have to work for them to never catch up. And after I was hit hard during Hurricane Katrina in, in 05, after I was hit hard during the housing crisis in 08, after I was hit hardest and during COVID-19, and so I can't get no financial capital from bootstrapping, I can barely afford the boot to strap on. So maybe you can just let me know. When you expect that money you owe me to come my way that you promised me that I keep dying for. There's this really cute house I want to buy for my family that they can live in for generations. You get it. If it helps, consider paying me an investment in your future. Okay, bye. Welcome to Turbine Arts Collective. It's my pleasure to introduce the host of This Is Now. He's an attorney, writer, activist, and one of the co-founders of Momifer Productions. Much of his work centers on the story of how his ancestors escaped from slavery and his dedication to bending the arc of history toward justice. Please welcome Terry Franklin. Thank you so much, Rob. I am blown away, frankly, by Joshua's uh, rendition uh, really of the history of, of, of America and really the justification for reparations. So I'm just gonna let that sit for just a second right here because that was so powerful. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna welcome you to This Is Now. Uh, this Is Now was the brainchild, and Rob's gonna hate me for saying this, of Turbine Arts Collector founder and animating spirit Rob Watsky, who shook by the murder of George Floyd offered this platform to black artists and thinkers to express themselves, their feelings, their rage, their frustration, their despair, their determination, their art, and their hope. On this special episode of This Is Now, in what we hope will be just the first of a series of conversations, we're tackling the big topic of reparations and we're gonna talk about it from various perspectives. Now, America is a country started by wealthy white men who had little sense that anyone other than those like them mattered much at all. They figured out that it worked out pretty well for them economically and in terms of power if they could hold out the promise of true equality for everyone but convince enough people below them that the power scale was such that the equality had to be doled out in little bits over which they controlled the spigot that they would keep the masses fighting one another for the bits instead of joining together to demand their share of the equality that the elites knew that they were entitled to. Well, creating a permanent class of people at the bottom who could forever and easily be marked as scapegoats and do all the work kept everything going pretty well for a while. But then they had to force, they had to be deal with the idea of violence and lies because the truth is that all people really are created equal every human being on the planet has the right to exist and citizens in this country have a right to be treated like human beings. The issue of reparations is being addressed in congressional legislation to establish a commission, a commission being established in California and Evanston 
uh, Illinois, where my college is located, chartered there by John Evans, who founded the university, who was also a committer of genocide of over 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho, Arapaho Indians at Sand Creek Massacre in 1846, 64. Well, yeah, that Evanston, they just started their own reparations program that's doling out some cash to some African Americans, but it's never enough. But today we're gonna to talk more about the lingering impacts of slavery and what we can do about it. And to give us some further historical context, I'd like to welcome a writer, producer, performer who has made it his life's work to master the art of story and to use that talent in every medium to help educate, heal, and make the world a better place. Please welcome C.B. Murray joining us here from New York. C.B., come on on. I'm gonna sit myself down doing? and get comfy because Terry, how you doing? I'm okay. How you doing, my friend? Man, I'm still, I'm still trying to get over that amazing <laughs> Joshua gave us. It was it's amazing. Everything. Covered it all, right? Oh, it like I kept thinking, awesome. okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I, I'm finished. He's <laughs> so let me just, you know, go into this reparations. You know, I'm gonna do it like Joshua just did a, a broad overview and just talk about what it is. And first of all, reparations is making amends for a wrong that's done or paying money or some other way of giving back what you have taken from someone. And when you think about the Black American, African American, um, if we only talked about slavery, we had physical, mental, financial, and spiritual harm done to us for over 400 years uh, as they tried to build this country. Now, we said this, you know, they love to say this is a Christian country. Well, if it were a Christian country, according to Deuteronomy 15, um, you could only have a slave for six years because at the seventh year, you had to free all your slaves and you couldn't let them leave empty handed, but you had to give them as much as they could carry after you set them free. So I guess that kind of like throws out the whole idea that this is a Christian country. But <laughs> America, I think of America as the, the great kleptocracy, the great steel. Because you, to make this country, they had to steal us from Africa. Then they stole our culture. Then they stole our language. They stole our identity. They stole our family. They stole our children. And, and most of all, they stole our lives. So we want to say, why reparations? You know, I, I saw um, the Republican Party leader, I don't want to say his name, say that, it was, you know, why should, we, why should people pay for something 150 years ago that none of us were alive for? But, it wasn't just slavery, but we could go down the list of things for that, that we need reparations because of slavery, the, recon the reconstruction period. And Joshua said, it. you know, we were promised 40 acres and a mule by Lincoln, but Lincoln was killed. So Andrew Johnson reversed that and gave the land back to the owners <laughs> and took the mules. Uh, let's talk about, you know, Jim Crow. We all know the results of Jim Crow and, and, and how it, it kept the heels or we should say the knees and the necks of uh, uh, black Americans. Or right. the Great Migration, when we we just tried to get out the South and go North and and and, and be a part of the American dream, but unfortunately, there was government-sponsored mortgage discrimination, redlining, keeping us from having a part of the American dream, not being able to build any generational wealth whatsoever, and the government played a part in those on-contract deals, right? Segregation, separate but never equal, not equal. And how that hurt us, you know, I'm old enough to remember the black and white water fountains, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, mass incarceration, how we are disproportionately jailed in this country and then put into these private prisons where we then sent out to work making what 60 cents a day while they make $20 an hour. Come on, or oh, police brutality. Let me, you know, I can't even look at the George Floyd trial because it's too triggering. I can't take it now. They try to, whenever we say reparations, those against it try to act like it's, you know, it's something new. We've never heard of this before, but they've paid reparations twice to slave owners. In, in 1837 and in 1862, they, they paid them $300 per slave that they would let go free, which is equivalent to like $8,000 per person. But they can't give reparations to the, the ones who were enslaved and, and treat it like cattle. I mean, basically, we <laughs> were treated like, you know, the pigs, the horses, and the cows. Right. Just uh, property. <laughs> property. And our offspring was sold from under us. My grandmother's mother 
told her stories over and over again about how she was in the field with her sister. And they said, I like that one and took her and she never saw her sister again. And she would tell us the story every year because she wanted us to remember. This is vital, oh. <laughs> vital memory. And it's there, you know, it's in our bodies too, right? Oh, yes. I, I suggest anybody to read Ta-Nehisi Coates' um, The Case for Reparations, mm -hmm. because he really deals with um, the Federal Housing Administration and how they, they paid a, a part in that, you know, redlining and keeping Black people in this, this ghetto where they could just keep coming in and stealing their money, making them think they had a possibility of owning a home and then snatching it from under them and giving it to, and selling it to someone else, snatching it and just doing this over and over. It was a vicious cycle. They owe us for that. They do, <laughs> and, and refusing to issue loans unless lenders would would participate in the red lines and not rent their homes to, to black people and, and racially restrictive covenants. They all agree that they wouldn't let black people move in. And in the neighborhood that I grew up in, uh, three years before I was born, I think it was 100% white. And by the time I was five or six years old, it was 60% black in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I, I, I grew up in the South, I grew up in Richmond, and I grew up under the thumb of segregation, under the thumb of, of separate but not equal. I, I know what I've ne I, I never want to live in the South again. I just can't see uh, <laughs> going back there. Really, I just can't see it. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't blame you. Hunky dory because I found out it's everywhere, but I just don't want to go backwards. <laughs> Exactly. And, and that's what I'm saying. You know, the big cities had the same issues and same and issue. there were ways that that creating racial hierarchy uh, was used to keep us pressed down and to avoid treating everybody as human beings. I think that's the part of it that makes it so well, frustrating. Makes me the most angry because um, there's something called critical race theory. And it basically it, it's, it's letting us know that race is a construct of of colonization. We were not, people were not um, in the in, in the in the world, when we think about the evolution of man, we came from families, tribes, and nations, not races. Right. That was something that the, the colonists did so that they could justify taking people's lands and and enslaving them. But you have um, like the, the white evangelical church now coming against the idea of, of critical race theory because they they still adhere to white supremacy, and. They, and, and they have this other thing, with this empathy fallacy, where they, they say, well, come on, y'all, let's all hold hands, and we're going to pray and ask forgiveness and sing Kumbaya, and it's all going to be done. Well, I sung Kumbaya with about 12 of them, and it's still nothing has changed. Well, you know, the problem is when you have racism that's already baked in, even if you claim to try to do a Kumbaya from here forward, you're baking in the backwards system that already exists. So, uh, you know, let's... Tell, tell us a little more and then I want to bring in some other guests so okay. we can talk a little bit more too. Basically what we're talking about is government accountability and whether it's from you know the, the established church or whatever or, or, or Senate, these people are fighting the idea of them being accountable. And it makes me angry because in 1946, during, after the um, Second World War, we decided to come up with something called the International Bill of Rights. America decided to tell the rest of the world how they were supposed to treat people. And this was in the 1940s. Well, during that same time, they were lynching us and killing us and not allowing us to buy homes, but they were telling the rest of the world, you got to live like this and you got to do people better. And so now the hypocrisy of it all, you, you know, right? You had Cory Booker leading the discussion in the Senate in 2019. And today they're only discussing a bill to study, not give, study the idea of reparations. I'm so glad you talked about Everston, um, Illinois, because it seems like um, this is something that we're that the people as a community have to come together on before the we can't we can't trust the government to do it, you know. No. We 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 vote for politicians hoping that they will be servants with the ability to lead, but until they do, as a people, we have to come together. I, I applaud Everston, Illinois, and the other places that have come together to try to do something that we can't get the government to do, but it's. It's beyond a fact that we are more than owed for the things that have been done to us. More than owed. And I think it's about, you know, individuals coming together. I think, you know, the more I read about reparations and, and the importance of 
having communities invested in, in the process of developing what it is that makes sense for those communities. Uh, there's something called target universalism. We'll talk about that, but let me bring on some other guests. If, uh, you you wanna share a little bit more with us or let me kind of bring on no, some- No, bring some somebody on. All right. Um, Let's see, Th thank you so much. Uh, our next guest, uh, this is a good time to bring on Pam Knowles, who's a writer and storyteller. Pam, Pam uh, uh, you worked on this uh, issue back in your days as a reporter, right? Yes, when I was a reporter for the uh, Tampa Tribune. Um, and it's, it's, it's about, uh, also wait, first I have to do this. Joshua, Joshua. <laughs> all right put I need, that down I need a it's, it's the farmers or farmers or black farmers who were very deliberately not given the reparate uh, not given the, the 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 money they needed to run their farms compared to white farmers it is rosewood 1923 it is okichi um 1920 election day 1920 in florida um, that day, 50 people were murdered because 50 people, uh, because the black people were like, we're going to, we, we get to vote. We're going to do it. And it was not allowed. Rosewood is the jam though, right? I'm just going to say that the jam. Uh, and I say that the jam, like uh, Tulsa, <laughs> the jam, because more white people know about it now, but we have those stories from our oral histories of our families who have talked about what happened. I was um, a reporter when they were filming that movie. And I had been out in Florida for the Tampa Tribune when they were filming that movie. And I had been trying to get them to talk about the other things Stan Okochi and the others, but my 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 white editors wouldn't allow me. They were like, mm. "Well, is that a real thing?" You know, at that time, right? Is it a real thing? Do you can we really trust you to do this because you are biased? All right, that is bias for the my truth. Whole bias for the truth. As a journalist, <laughs> you are biased. The white men are not biased. Mm. But I am biased if I want to do a story of America. I want to do a story of America. I want to talk to these people to let them say. And I, all the time I went through to get their trust to talk to me. But they said, we'll send you down there for they're filming the Rosewood movie. And I knew at that time, the director uh, was like, I don't want any of you fuckers here. Mm. I don't want any of your media. He actually, he didn't say fuckers, but he did say, he put it out there. <laughs> you get the well. idea. <laughs> he did say, I don't want any of you media people here. And I, when they were trying to tell me, my bosses, my white bosses, my liberal, well-meaning, they, they care, <laughs> bosses. But I was the only black feature writer they had on staff. When I said no, that caused problems for me down the road, but wow. I would do it again. However, okay, so the Rosewood descendants. So there were nine descendants known officially of the Rosewood massacre. And it took on for like 20 years until 1994, when finally the Florida state legislator said, yes, we're sorry we'll give you $2 million in compensation. And we'll also set up a, a, an additional um, for your children hmm. for college, right? But when that whole thing was going on, they would not use the word reparation during the arguments because they thought that it was a dangerous term. If you say reparations officially in a government sense, then that's like saying genocide officially in a government sense. That triggers a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. where, right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us, and I do know from my, from stories from my personal family, you know, 
both my dad and my mom, it's, it's blended family, it's complicated. But I do know that we had land way back in the day. And my great grandfather actually ran from the south to the north because, you know, maybe possibly he killed somebody who was raping his, oh. yeah, you know, whatever. But the land. Got to do what you got to do. Yeah, that's what you had to do. But if that land, if we still had it, hmm. the right. money we would have. You know, right. it's, the, it's the compounding, you know, that's part of it. Too. And I, I was reminded, if anybody's watching on Zoom, you should feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Uh, we would love to have your questions to feed our, feed our discussion. Uh, uh, Reparations are not a simple thing. <laughs> when white people hear it, they're like, I didn't do this. Why should I pay for it? Why should my taxes pay for it? It's not you. It's where you came from. It's your descendants. It's your grandfather. It's your great grandfather. What did you do during the war, Daddy? Right. Ask them that. Right. Well, Ask you them. know, the other thing that's interesting, uh, and there's a book out now called The Sum of Us, uh, what we can do about um, uh, reparations, but it, it, it's about the impact of slavery on the entirety of our country and the economic loss of ra that's caused by racism, by the illogic of racism, by making things forced into a situation so that people end up doing things like abandoning our wonderful public pools, because rather than swim in a pool that could be contaminated by one of those people, mm. uh, you'd rather shut it down Take away yeah. the city's funds and put that money, and 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 the book uh, by Heather McGee, who was the head of the Demos um, think tank, really goes into wonderful detail about how much we would gain by by you know there's a, a a dividend of solidarity by individuals recognizing our shared humanity and our shared values and getting over this crazy racism that we have. Uh, but let me bring on some other guests. Uh, uh, Pam, did you want to tell us a little bit more as I get ready to? Uh, I just announce? wanted to say I love that dividend of solidarity. Mm -hmm. So true. And even here in California, same thing here. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. It's every nation, every state in our nation. It's an issue. And, and it's a money maker. You know, that, that's, that, that's what well, we're learning for, for everyone, for white people too, as we lift up uh the those who are at the bottom it raises all the votes for everyone and and that brings me to uh somebody who is in the financial business uh, i'm going to bring on my friend ray odom i'm going to ask him to join us uh, he's been working uh, on a way to approach reparations through targeted use of the estate tax ray recently spoke on the wealth Disp Disp disparity panel of congresswoman joyce Beatty with michael eric dyson at the congressional black caucus foundation convention Joining us from Chicago, while we're from everybody, we've got New York, we've got Chicago and LA. Please welcome Ray Odom. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Terry. Just enjoy it. Man, I'm having a, I'm having a great time. Uh, just so many, so many great insights here. But you know, it's one, one of the things I think is difficult is you take all of the history and one of the things that has come out, it's, there's a word for it, you can look it up in Wikipedia. It's called wicked problem, wicked problem. Now, people who are in design have been using this term quite often. And what they mean by that, it's a problem that is so complex that potential solutions to the problem may in fact be worse than the problem. Mm -hmm. And there is so much variability. You can think of it as a infected a waterway where you introduce a species to eat another species. Well, all of a sudden you, you've messed up 20 variables that you didn't even think about. And so they came up with this term. You can really say it's, it's called a wicked problem. It has all kinds of components. To it. And what the reason that that's so important in this area is that when um, a people do not understand the complexity of a problem, especially in this area, what they do is they ask you to come up with a solution, which by definition can't work yet, and then, of course, since it's a solution that can't work, it fails. And then they prove to you that ah, either there wasn't a problem, or you're stupid because you didn't know that you didn't got you got the wrong solution. Right. And so it's just a killer. So go ahead, Terry, if you want to. to break no, no, in I'm, I'm just I'm just right there. You go, <laughs> you go, Ray. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. 
here's and so the, the but the thing with reparations is they love to kind of uh, to get it personalized, to get it tied into something that's related to them, I didn't. And of course, the whole thing of being white is to not know it, right? So you're you're talking to people who you know who are living in smog, who created smog, but say, look, I don't see anything. <laughs> oh, are you? Excuse me, was that you choking the death? <laughs> you know, it's like it's what I tell people. It's like COVID. You know, there's people who are killing other people and are convinced that they're great just because they don't have as bad as symptoms as, as racist man over here who's who's spewing <laughs> sputum. But anyway, let's get back to the story of reparations. So let's start at the beginning. You know, and let's just be clear about it. America had indentured servants and they had black indentured servants and white indentured servants. The bottom line was they needed a way to get labor here because when you're in a place where it doesn't where you can't you know make your own um, you know uh, sauces and and you don't have any you know uh, hardware manufacturing what you got to do is you got to basically take all that you can produce put it together and then sell it for stuff that you need and so the only thing they were really doing let's just cut it to the chase they were doing tobacco. So people like tobacco and they just said, okay, we'll just make this tobacco. And look, we need to get tobacco, we need a lot of tobacco workers. So if you'll come over to America and help us make some tobacco, we'll let you, uh, we'll, we'll pay for your way over here. And if you'll pay for someone to come over, we'll let you have uh, maybe 10, 15 acres in repayment for the cost of their coming over. So you pay for them to come over. If they serve out their indenture, then we'll give you some land. And so that's how they were getting lots of people over. But the only people they're getting over are people who are under some hardship, right? Because if you're in England having a good time, why don't you come on, go over here and you'll know, get <laughs> shot at and everything else? No. So, but they get some people that with some slave ships come over from Portugal. Because remember, they were they were doing slavery long before America. So they, they've been in slavery 200 years. So they get those slave ships over here with the slavers, and they're both together in the fields having a good time, black folk and white folk. And all of a sudden, there's a landowner, and he goes, well, this is working out well. Only problem is the indentured servants actually get done. Thank you, CB. Maybe five, seven years, the Bible is seven, but these guys, it's actually about five years. The, the thing they counted on, Terry, that you might not know, is most of those indentured servants actually died during that five years. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, But the reality is, eventually, a lot of these people start getting, and they start, this is great. Now, the way you get an indentured servant to keep indenting is that you tell them, look, if you don't keep working hard, we'll add on to your system. And they can actually use the courts to increase that system. And so a person says, okay, all right, yeah, fine. You, I don't want to work for another two years. I'm going I'm to do what you want. Now, remember, what we're starting out is a capitalism that is at the core of everything. We've got a capitalism that says, look, I just need you to give me more tobacco because tobacco is money. Money is stuff. Stuff is happiness. Well, here's the problem. They got to change this. They got to get they got to get this thing going. And they say, look, you know what? We like these black slaves you guys got in us. They seem to get along with each other. But you know the problem is um, they don't have as much incentive. And now it's getting a little bit more expensive for the indentured servants because I can actually, um, you know, with the five year thing, I'm losing the indentured guy and I got to start over. But with the slave, I'm just good. And, and, you know, I, I can get more. Out. And so it's actually a lot more uh, capitalist, uh, in, you know, uh, profitable for me to have. Them. So, and actually, I need a lot more. I don't have enough. And I can't get any more over from there. And, oh, by the way, the head right system's going bad because the Indians are now killing all those people I gave the acres to. So that's not working out like I thought it would. So actually, here's what we need to do. If you would... Uh, we need to come up with a system so that we can make these slaves work. Oh, that's right. We can't take them to court to make them have more years. Oh, oh, we got to beat them. Oh, we got to start doing things to dehumanize them. Oh, but that's right. We're in, under English law. Under English law, you can't beat human beings, right? Because, I mean, they had servants and everybody, you know, every country has slaves and servants. But you can't, like, cut their arms off, you can't maim them, and you sure can't lynch them. Of course, you wouldn't want to lynch them because they're property. But after a while, you know, indentured servants actually went to criminal court and people went to jail for what you could do to an indentured servant. Ah, we need something. So, mm, oh, I got it, a theory. We need a theory that allows us to treat these people as something that our laws can now protect and allow us to beat them, murder them, maim them. We need laws that allow us to do terrorism to get them working. But that's going to require something that our laws don't allow. 
oh, that's right. Well, why don't we just do what the Spanish do and say that they're not really human? It works perfect. That's right. So here we are, I'm Jefferson. I come up with this great ideal for America, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, here we go. Life, liberty, and pursuit. And that's what every human being gets. It's inalienable. And by the way, the reason I did that because I'm Jefferson, I hate aristocracy. Oh, did I tell you I am aristocracy? But you see, I don't like British aristocracy because then the British guys tell me what to do. And I'm all the way over here in America and I hate being told what to do, which is why I came over here. So now I don't like them anymore because they're royalty. They think they're better than me. And nothing gets a white man more angry than someone who thinks they're better than him. So they're going to say, oh, King George, you are a, I mean, it was, they, they pretty used some color. Blame. And we are different because we believe that every human being has the full right to all the things you arist aristocrats take away from me. Did I say I was this way? No, I mean, King George aristocrats, the people on the kings and these royalty. But I want a country that's everyone's equal. Oh, did I say that I had some slaves? Did I mention to you that not only do I have slaves, but <laughs> these slaves accrue to me through this thing called inheritance? Oh, but here's the thing. I'll, I'll cut to the chase quick. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what you, so what they did is they said, okay, they're subhuman. So what we'll do is we'll take their life. Ah, that means they can't have well-being. Number two, we'll take their liberty. That means they can't have mobility. They can't even marry who they want to. We, they can't even have a right to be married or do a, any right to association or sociality. Then, oh, we will not allow you to pursue happiness. Oh my God, we can't let you do that. That would mean that you'd have to actually be able to choose your uh, thing that you do, save money to do things. So we take life, liberty, and happiness. And so when they take that, now you can't accrue it. And now the value of that, here's the key. The key is you have to come up with something that measures that. And here's what it was. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness allowed you to create wealth. And the one thing that happens, this is very clever. The one thing that you can't do with wealth is take it with you when you, yeah, die. And so here's the problem. Once a person dies, no one owns their money. Can I get an amen to that? Once a person dies, nobody owns that money. So the problem in America was, like in every country, what kind of laws are we going to set in place? Because what we find out, Jefferson found it out early, if you can inherit lots of money, how about 200 slaves? If you're going to get that kind of inheritance, you get a head start. Jefferson and our system assumed an equal starting line. That's important. Meritocracy starts at a starting line. If you don't have a starting line, you don't have a good meritocracy. You don't have an egalitarianism. You don't have the thing that you're looking for. And so the way they, they tried to prevent that was, well, what are we going to do about the inheritance? Well, here's what, here's what he said. Jefferson said, we don't want to allow that inheritance, that swollen fortune of these aristocrats. Because remember, Terry, Terry, if we allow people to inherit wealth, they'll become like the king and queen. We'll, we'll, we'll get right back to an aristocracy. We don't want that. So we're going to make sure that we don't have large concentrations of wealth. You can actually find the words large concentrations of wealth talked about by Jefferson. This was really important to him. Well, what happens? You get large concentrations of wealth. The plantation owners get bigger and bigger. We have an American aristocracy, and it's based on the idea that we're white. We're right, and you're subhuman. And so all of a sudden, they invent this thing called the estate tax. And you're saying, right, who cares about this? It's the only tax that you can find that says simply one thing. We, as a country, actually believe what Jefferson said. And we're actually going to take away concentrated wealth and redistribute it. Did you hear me? Redistribute it. Does that sound like something? Re reparations? <laughs> so the, idea, the idea is that we can do this. And so what you did is, and this tax that was started by, oh, by the way, I wish I could read to you the quote from, um, uh, uh, from uh, Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men, white men ever. He was so rich that he actually had more money than the annual government budget. Of course, the government wasn't as big then, but it's like he had like $4 trillion on his own. So what he said is that there is no purpose for this country to allow the hoarded wealth of selfish millionaires to be passed down to anybody. That's a white man saying that. So <laughs> he got the progressive thing. <laughs> they said, yeah, he's right. This wealth, now remember, black people, they got, we're subhuman, but they forgot something, that they use this um, wealth to, they use this thing to stop uh, wealth disparity. And I'm, I'm getting to the punchline here. 
They said, we will use the state tax to, to prevent wealth disparity. And they did. They actually created a tax that took 77% at one point. One more time, did you hear me? 77%, that was actually taking your money and redistributed it, it went down after that. But, the, but here's the key. What they didn't realize is if you're trying to do wealth disparity redistribution, who is it that has the greatest wealth disparity? Yeah, that's us. Here's the key. When you design the right reason for reparations, you will get the right result. The right reason is wealth disparity. Wealth disparity is the proof. Brother Terry, it is the actual dollar. I mean, it is just, here's how bad it is, Brother Terry. Terry, the wealth disparity is so bad that as you, everyone on this call, literally, you are making, you have 10 times the amount, you have 10 times less, one tenth of the wealth that you should have for who you are. So CB, I know CB is good. So whatever you add CB, whatever you, and I know you're good CB, but you got one tenth of what you should have. Terry, you a litigator. You got one tenth of what you should have. Pam, you all that sister, you got one tenth. And you'll say, well, but Ray, what about Oprah? So Oprah goes room, just my last example. Oprah goes in a room with all billionaires. She goes in a room with all billionaires. She says, hey, yeah, what, what are you guys doing? Oh yeah, I'm gonna buy, I'm thinking about buying the Lakers. Oh yeah, how much they all oh, they going? I think the Lakers want like 2 billion. But oh, too bad. Okay. Oh boy, I might be in the wrong room. How about over here? What are you doing? Oh, I'm buying this and this. It's a couple billion, but I'm and you you're in the room, you know how much she got? She got two billion. That's if she liquidates everything she owns. When when Oprah Winfrey goes in the billionaire room, she figures out what you and I should. I'm telling you now, we're all, <laughs> all of us, of this. And why? Because the melanin in our skin allowed them to deprive us of life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But it was so systemic, it was so ingrained that you, it didn't show up. So what you do is you have a tax designed to do what they always wanted to do, which is to keep rich people from creating an aristocracy, only they don't know that that tax now makes us its beneficiaries. All we have to do is give people like you, Terry, they'll give us a, a time to talk about this and say, look, don't give us anything except that, that estate tax, because that's what that tax is for. By the way, how much is that? 23 billion a year. That's not enough. That's not enough, but it's a good start. And the reason why I think it's it's a good start is because Terry, I I'm, unlike CB, I mean, I'm okay with the committee. Is this gonna take them about an ongoing five years? In fact, <laughs> I'm gonna go with this brother, Terry. The reality is we've got to plan on there mm -hmm. being mistakes. We got to plan on, see if we don't tell those white folks, we are going to do some reparational things and they're actually not going to be effective because see, we already did this with, with, with integration, with affirmative action. You, we know how you roll. And you know what, Terry, you can never get a complete solution to evil. It morphs. <laughs> it, it's always morphing and shaping and moving yeah, to yeah, find yeah. its way. Let, and, and let me, I let feel me what you're saying, yes. right? But we need allies. When you brought up uh, yeah. Jefferson and God bless everything you said, a atheist me says, God bless everything you said, because it's about language. <laughs> it's about this. talking in the language that they can understand. Right. Jefferson, he said in one of his writings, yep. when the first ship, the first official slave ship landed yep. in 1619, what did he say? Heaven remains silent. He knew this was going to be horrible. Mm. But oh, he didn't he do did. anything about he it. Who did. But, but, but we need all everything you said. We can't do the reparations on our own. We need the white people in power to be allies, to do it, to pull it off. That's yep. And that's how it, let, let me, 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 bring, let me, let me, let, let me bring on our other guests so, so they can oh, join this sorry. because, because they're going to love this. I love you. Know? you. I love you. I, 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 I want to bring okay. Joshua in uh, and Joshua started us off and I, we didn't give him an intro, uh, but he has this amazing improv background, award-winning heights as an actor, writer, acclaimed beatboxer, uh, Meghan Markle's first kiss. Hold on a second. <laughs> He's an educator, and we're all going to share our participants' information at the end of the show. But I also want to bring on Anna Varnon. Uh, Anna is a humor advocate and recovering comedian who shares true survival stories and tips to help y'all stay out of jail. Uh, they're going to add to our discussion. And I want to throw out one thing quickly, too. Um, you know, a lot of this is about why it is that we justify the need for reparations. And uh, one thing that was interesting was in the Brown versus Board Education decision, uh, which 
knocked out uh, separate but equal. Uh, the court focused on, remember those studies that, uh, that showed that black children uh, wanted the white doll and that was part of what helped explain and uh, the story that gave the passion to recognizing that this difference between whites and blacks was a problem. Well, one of the appendices that they did not include was the analysis of what the impact was on white people. And what they said was that white children who learned the prejudices of our society were being taught to gain personal status in an unrealistic and non-adaptive way. They were not required to evaluate themselves in terms of the more basic standards of actual personal ability and, and achievement. And what's more, they often develop, develop patterns of guilt feelings, rationalizations, and other mechanisms which they must use in an attempt to protect themselves from recognizing the essential injustice of their unrealistic fears and hatreds of minority groups. Uh, you know, the, so the best research of the day concluded that confusion, conflict, moral cynicism, and disrespect for authority may arise in white children as a consequence of being taught the moral, religious, and, and undemocratic principles of justice and fair play by the same persons and institutions who seem to be acting in a prejudiced and, and discriminatory manner. So Brown missed out on the part that uh, you know, explains why we are today with people thinking that they are entitled to whatever it is that they can demand and step their foot, feet on and hold a gun to demand instead of recognizing that we all have the same rights. So come on, join this conversation with us, Josh and, <laughs> Joshua and Anna. Uh, oh, talk us. Well, okay, well, First of all, before I before I do anything, I want you guys, this book is called Stamped from the Beginning. This should be in every library, in every personal library, in everyone's house in this country. Just like you got a Bible and a dictionary, you should have this because this lays out this, and this is the remix. This is the shortened version. There's two books. But I, I like this one because I, I was part of a two-person book club over the summer, and this was our book. And it's, it's it tells you how, you know, it's not black, against, you know, first two, it, it became black against white because when like when the white guys got out of uh, got out of the out of the service. Uh, and this was like um, the Civil War, the whites and in, indentured servants got land, black people didn't. And so it's just, I, you know, it's 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 an, it's just. It's amazing to me that I am as old as I am. And I just did a, I just did a test on the stress calculator. It tells you how life uh, uh, issues affect you. And according to this stress calculator, I added uh, you know, a couple of points for racism. <laughs> I should be between 125 and 160 years old. You look good. So, you look yeah, amazing. I, I look great. I look great and I feel great. So. Uh, you know, that's why I have lowered the BS factor in my life. I don't do it anymore. I'm not around people I don't trust. I'm not around people that are, that are you know, tunnel visioned in. Uh, and, you know, this thing about reparations, did you know that the Jesuit priests in Georgetown, came, they pledged $100 million for, to, to pay to, uh, as reparations to the slaves that they sold to keep that college afloat had they not sold their slaves there would be no georgetown and <laughs> everything that went along with that we've got uh uh what is it called uh the beach here uh bruce's beach down in manhattan beach, manhattan beach. was yes was a black beach that was bought by black people so that they would have a place to go to the beach the city used eminent domain to claim that they were going to put up a park and just took took their land took their land away. So, I mean, you know, you, and we've had, we just had such a very polite relationship with racism. You know, we just kind of <laughs> went, well, you know, you know, we don't want to embarrass anybody by telling them how, how cracked up this is. And, you know, those days are over. You know, we've got kids, my, my best, okay, now, and then this is my last thing. My <laughs> best, the best joke that I ever remember hearing as a child came from Dick Gregory. And they were talking about the drugs in the black community. And Dick Gregory says, look, black people don't own ships. Black people don't own planes. 
black people don't, you know, black people, most black people don't even have a passport. But you can tell me that a 10 year old in Harlem knows where the heroin man is and the CIA don't know. How does that okay. work? Okay. <laughs> what so, is you know, that so, 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 so let's, you know, let's, let's not, we don't have to be polite anymore. We can call people on stuff. I think this you know, is that like moment. Had, you know, the Me Too moment. This is the Me Too moment for Black folks. This is that moment. Um, and let me, there's a question here, and I know uh, Joshua may want to speak too, and you may speak to this question, but I know Guy and Tony Whitlock said, how can we come up with a formula that addresses generations of systemic racism that would repay current and future generations of historically disenfranchised people that's not too little and too short term? Our white counterparts would love to come up with a one and down payment but no amount could address the damage of hundreds of years of systemic racism. Any suggestions, panel? I mean, I feel like one of the things that we haven't spoken about yet is cognitive dissonance, right? And cognitive dissonance was the precursor to slave owners going, well, this is right, because they, they knew it was wrong. I mean, you look at, you look at when, um, my wife and I were talking about this last night, about when race started. And it was all about categorizing uh, for value's sake, right? There was like, okay, well, this, this plant is better than this plant because other nations were doing that. But it was Europeans who were like, well, this, you know, th these aren't just plants, this is the best plant. This is the best race, right? Because they were, they were scientists. They were looking at bodies and going, oh shit, they're the same. But I don't, I don't like that. Like, I don't like how that feels. So how do I make myself believe that I'm better? Oh, well, this is, this is bad. Black is bad. You know, Jefferson uh, did, did, did a thing similar to the same thing where it was like, um, you know, these, these black women, uh, he wrote in his book, like to sleep with apes more than they like to sleep with their own people. Like this is Jefferson. This is the father of our country. So there is something intrinsic with 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 America, with being American, which is to suggest that it makes sense to be racist, right? And I think the only way we get anywhere is if we start to identify the fact that we live on a foundation that that is that is racism. That once you undo that, the whole infrastructure of what America is crumbles and i don't think you're going to ever have white people on board with anything and so white people can accept that they have to give up their privilege so that there can be change and shifts shifting so because you're because you're right whoever asked the question like pay, paying that money is going to be great i'm gonna buy all my nikes but that's not going to do anything if it, because that money's just going to go to white america you know what I'm saying? We don't have anything set up in place to allow us to thrive with that reparation. And we're still, and we're building that. And, you know, and, and, and so it's just, you know, like Raymond said, it's just going to take time. Mm -hmm. They have to give up their privilege unapologetically without wanting credit for that. Right? Yeah. They, they have to like, give up like, their privilege without... Us They're being, never giving up their privilege. They don't give up. Welcome. People don't give up privilege. Yeah, we we can't deal with the white fragility because it's not yeah. necessary. And we have really this racism thing goes back even before America. It was something called the doctrine of destiny that set Columbus and all those people afloat. It was because the church said to them that when you come into a land and these people don't believe the way you believe, they don't look the way you look, you have the right to take away what they have and use them for whatever purpose. So this goes way back in, in, into Europe. And, and so, even before then. Yeah, so, you know, and, and so many, different. you know, yeah, black people weren't the only people put into slavery, but we were the only ones kept into slavery that long. We were the only ones- Chattel slavery. There was a right. different- it was Took their language Chattel away, took their families sense. away. You know, that nobody else went through what we went no. through for the time we went, and the way we went through it. Well, when you think about the fact that they changed the law to make sure that uh, that the status passes from the woman, so that you can make sure that a white man can continue to create babies that will he can continue to use as product and livestock on his farm. He gives free license to rape women who have no control over what's gonna happen. We're protecting white women because 
the status is preserved for the white woman. So the, the, and white women are happy with that to some degree because they can say, okay, go get it, go do what you want to do. I'm fine over here. I just got a book called They Were Her Property, which is all about yeah. white women who were uh, slave owners throughout the South. And as brutal. And, and they've, exactly, they've we have this image pass. that they've they don't do pass. this, but they've gotten this pass. But yeah. you think about the fact that even in the United States, uh, you know, we had laws that said, we'll give land to any white person who will take a gun and protect us from the Native Americans. Uh, so go stake your claim and there's your property. And that yeah. gets transferred from generation to generation to generation at the same time that African Americans are property. So they can't even expect any kind of entitlement. And how are you expecting to deal with a racial inequality gap unless you make an adjustment for that. And you know, that's where we are. That's what we gotta do because we're broken. You know, I think we, we, white people snap their humanity in half when they decided that we can put all of our most negative, horrible aspects on this other creature there. And just like James Baldwin said, America has to ask itself, why did it need a nigga in the first place? We can cut off our humanity, put all that crap over there in this other thing and push everything down there and we can maintain ourselves, that only lasts so long. And we're at a point Donations. right now, if the only way they're gonna get back their humanity is if they let go and recognize this is not a zero sum game, that a gain by blacks does not mean a loss by whites. We all have to be creating value together. We have to be working as individuals, recognizing that we have shared value that that our public institutions need to be built up that we should have swimming pools and that we should have public schools that everybody can attend instead of white people moving into a neighborhood and i felt it too you know oh we got kids well we don't want to send them to the neighborhood school well i believe in public education but i don't want to be the one to risk our children so right. let's fork over some money and send them to a private school because that will be better for them because we have bought into this notion too that somehow schools that have diverse groups or black students are somehow less. And the way we have to figure out how to make that language and it's ridiculous that we have to figure out how to talk to them in a way where they don't feel like it's not me, you're attacking me, you're attacking me, I'm not the one. And they need to, and, and it's it's ridiculous that once again the burden is on us. Yeah, but there's this thing, there's, the natives there's to subliminal... figure out how to try to talk to them so they can listen, they can make a space to listen and build rather than you know you're just angry black, you're just angry Latino, you're just angry trans, you're just angry whatever, and they walk away, not listen, and nothing fucking changes. Because the problem for them is subliminal. Mm. They are racist without realizing they're being racist. They were brought up under a doctrine of destiny that told them that they were better than everyone else, not just yeah. black people, but everyone. Everybody. Else. So yeah. for, for us to have this, this, this reckoning, there has to be a, you have to drop that identity. And that's what's very scary for them, dropping that identity of being better than everyone else. It's a caste system. It's the yeah. thing is, yeah. we don't, yeah. it's a caste system. And if you don't put the complexity of caste, because caste has to do with privilege, it has to do with honor, it has to do with, with, with everything. It's much bigger than just melanin. And that's why uh, someone asked on, on the question, said, well, you know, how's this going? We need 20 billion every year for the rest of the time our country. And that's just <laughs> the research money. That's the research money. That, people, see, everybody wants to run to people getting some money. We're old, even by the people, Darity had just wrote uh, From Here to e Equality. They're, the numbers in that book, I can give them to you. There's numbers as high as 17 trillion. So let's get over the fact that people don't get a check because interestingly, this one quick fact, they, the people who wanted the 40 acres didn't want a check. One more time, are you listening? They didn't ask for a D check. They said, give me the means to succeed, create community, move forward and build the life that gives me life, liberty and happiness. I don't need your damn money. Just give me a chance. Give me so a chance. How do we get, how do we figure out we can't do it alone. We need the allies who are in power. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And okay. the allies who are the mothers, the white mothers, daughters, fathers, sons, the the how did, captains of industry. We have to figure out how to do our so message so they listen. And so Terry already got it. He's, he's, he's Terry said, look. You guys, you closed down a pool in St. Louis that had the ability to have 10,000 people swimming in it at one time. 10,000, we closed it down because they convinced you that black people had something wrong with them so that 300 black people getting in the water meant 10,000 of you had to leave. They've been doing that. Do you know you just voted to get health care because it was named after a black man and there's 20 million of you that ain't got no shit? Do you want me to keep going, sister? You don't need to keep going. What you need to do is listen. The question is, how do we make, how do we figure out how to get those? It's not us. It's, 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 them. it's, it's getting that message. So listen to us. It, it's, yes. How do you to get that message us, heard? To ally uh, in truth. And, and I think, you know, there are various movements about truth and reconciliation, although I think the better word is truth and transformation because we need to have. Love truth, you, Raymond. Sorry to do the shutdown, but had to every once in a while. I, it's just what I do as a <laughs> Truth, racial healing, and and transformation, because that's what we need to have. Because until people can hear and not filter through Fox News or something else, that these are the impacts that will that will make your lives better. If you're holding on to racism, you're screwing yourself. Somehow, people need to understand that. One of the examples that they give in this uh, in that book is target universalism, and with that, the idea is that you you take into account you develop a universal policy goal, but develop strategies to achieve the goal that take into account the varied situations of the group involved. And the example that they give is redlining in in the United States. Uh, And Kamala Harris talked about it and uh, Elizabeth Warren talked about it. Okay, we need to fix this. Go to those places where you redlined before that are still those crappy neighborhoods. Give them the money that they need so that they can buy homes, so that they can begin to develop well, so that they can have the resources that they can transfer from generation to generation. I, I also so like you Swiss cheese it. Uh, Pam, I, think, I love what you're saying. How can we get them to understand? In Christianity, we call it repentance. How do we get people to admit that they are wrong and then do what's necessary to turn from that wrong? I, I tell you what. We, I tell you what. Like how? I, I, I feel like. You know, systemic racism was so intrinsic that we are not a we. I think that we are still, as a people, very much divided. I feel like colorism is very real. Classism is very real. I feel like the fact that Will Smith got up somewhere and was like, I never experienced racism. And, 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 and like that's the, that's the thing that like we are still not even tapped into our own our own shackles that are still hap- that are still holding us down today. And so I don't think that you know someone asked about Candace Owens, and I feel like Candace Owens is a, a, a direct reaction to I need to survive, and therefore I'm going to delete all of my who I am to coexist with whiteness because I see that whiteness is the way to success. So yeah, I got are, in and I'm going to get in. And now that yeah. they're out, I, I need, she's doing her, her perp forgiveness wall. Fuck yeah. Her. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like that's, if you look at, if you look at the way we're still so spread out and we don't support each other enough and we don't, we don't, we, we don't embrace community enough. I mean, like, you, you could totally give money to those inner cities that need them. And, and it's, it's possible that because the, 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 because of racism, the family infrastructure is not there. So there's nowhere that there's nothing to support them, the families in reinvesting into blackness. Right. So that, cause we still associate whiteness with, with, you know, the light. And so until we look at blackness as the light, we're going to constantly be kind of, you know, you know trying to figure it out and we're and, 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 and the thing that i want to say too before i stop talking is we're the we're the leadership of it like we're the trend like 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 blackness has always been the definition of what is awesome what is cool you know since you're welcome for rock and roll you're welcome for all the things. yeah like we are the trend so until we decide this is what it is white folk are going to be confused so you're saying in a way it's 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 more than an all you Raymond, CB, you're all saying variations of the same thing. There are layers, or or rather like no, 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 nodules, nodules, 
module, mod, modules, module houses. White, we got to get our shit together. We got to figure out how to deal with the white people who don't have their shit together. We have to deal with the residual guilt or blame or whatever. These are all modules that we can't bring together to build a firm house well, until at, everybody at, deals with their stuff and works together. I mean, I don't even think working together. I think just, I think being aware of your stuff. Look, the Black Lives Matter movement is is tough, right? And, and, and Pam, you and I both saw that all of a sudden it was Black Lives Matter except for trans black people, right? Like that, that like jumped way out of our, out, out of our peripheral, right? We were like, oh shit, like we're homophobic still. I forgot about that, right? Like I that's- a uh, little Nas guy. Yeah. But again, I'm an atheist, so I know I, I, I recognize and I appreciate yeah, Lil Christian Nas X. tradition, but I also say one of the reasons we were slaves because it was from the pulpit, but that's that's Wait. another thing back there. But here's, here's the key thing. You know, the here's the key thing. thing here's that a, here's kid a key. who had been traumatized forever and he puts that in his art. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then everybody's like, Oh, how are you doing that? It's terrible. You're wrong. I'm like, oh, dude. But God, that's how that that's that's black man. Get two things in. So two things I, I want to say. The two things oh, are number, number one is is that because CB said uh, 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 traumatized and repentance. Here's the key. I was thinking about who can you think of as a person who did everything right? Because every time I think somebody, I go, oh, he screwed up. Oh yeah, he did have that. Oh yeah. But there's one person. Trust me on this. There's one person that they've been doing biographies on. They've been looking at and they've been saying, hey. You know what? No matter how we cut and slice it, we don't really find anything bad on him. His name was Jesus. So here's the thing I want to uh, interest you in. Uh, the I'm reality is, is too. I think he actually sets the pattern. If you notice, uh, and I uh, check out James Cone and what he says, Jesus was lynched. Jesus was he was he was lynched by a group of people who said that they didn't like his ethnicity, his race, his construct. The police got him. His friends got him. So here's the point, though. I, I don't need you to believe in God. Just go check out Jesus. By the way, if you think that's a problem, Muslims believe in, in Jesus. Hindus believe in Jesus. There's about 5 billion people who believe in the historicity of Jesus. Okay? So as, an, as a person, I think, and the key is, is what he did, and this is to Joshua's point, uh, or someone's point, uh, CB's actually, privilege. He was the most privileged human being. He could do all sorts of things that he, he alone could do, but he surrounded, and here's my last point. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. Our problem is, uh, Pam, you shouldn't be talking to people who don't want to hear. And Joshua, there's a lot of people who are, you know what, to the questionnaire who said, hey, look, what about this? You know what? Think about it. Jesus talked to the biggest crowds. He was a rock star. And you know what his primary way was? He'd say a parable and they go, why did you put it in those terms? He goes, because, let me translate it, because I want the people who don't want to hear to go away. So I can talk to the people who come back and want to really find out what's going on. That's the answer, Pam. We got to find the people who really want to know, because those people will take us somewhere, Pam. And it don't matter what, by the way, Pam, it don't matter whether they believe Jesus ain't never run nobody away for being any kind of trans, upside, whatever. He loved them both. So it's Bill and I. I apologize. For George Clooney. So Bill and I, George Clooney, <laughs> uh, Brad Pitt sometimes. Sorry. And that's it. It's those three white guys. That's how we got. Who, who are those? Are those are. Uh, uh, but for for me, for uh, me one thing we, I think we've, we've overlooked is the fact that, and I think um. Joshua but that's a thing in, in that in we black. have to see ourselves as a group, as a power. What Stacey Abrams did in Georgia is a construct of what we have to do for everything to get what we want. We have to come together and demand it, and we use our numbers to do that because. Yes, and what they did to us in slavery was to separate us from family so that we didn't have a sense of unity and community. But we have to come back together and bring that together. And 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 just like there's a you know an Asian community and a Jewish community, we have to be the black community and we have to vote as a block and use our power as a block to get what we deserve back. And that's going to take coming together us coming together first, not about them, because some people will never want to give us anything. But we, if we come together as a group, as a powerful group, they have no choice. I, I agree with all that, but I also think that part of what I think we need to be doing is, you know, 
there still is that sort of zero sum game, us versus them, this group, that group. We're all human beings. We're all on this planet. We're all equally entitled to the same rights to exist and to you know, have the benefits of this country, the, the society that we live in. And I think we have to look at ourselves and recognize that we, the, the Japanese concept is eshofuni. We are at one with our environment. So there's no difference between me and everything else in this universe. If there's suffering out there, if there are children who are suffering, if there's pain that's happening, uh, I should have compassion for it. And I think we need to make sure that other people are inspired by the idea that we all have this commonality and that we all have to work together towards something that's better than us, that transcends whatever our race, whatever our religious aspects, whatever those backgrounds are. And together, if we are really looking at trying to look at the children that are going to be here and whether or not climate change, that's another example they give is how the rest of the world in this Some of All, Some of Us a book, the rest of the world recognizes, beginning to recognize that climate change is crappy for everybody. And we still have elite, white, powerful men in this country who feel like if we can just push the wind, it won't affect us. Uh, that, that, that if we just keep pushing it downhill, it's going to get to those people who we never had to deal with. But that's because they've invested in this idea that their whiteness makes them right. And so they have to preserve this world that they've always had. And they're screwing themselves because they're destroying the environment. And they're either writing it off as, well, I'll be dead anyway, and I don't care, or I'm going to have enough money, so I'll be able to, to, to slide through or fly to Alaska and be able to uh, have a little bit of cool air when all the heat is rising and the people are moving from the Southern hemisphere to the Northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. We gotta get enough people on the ground recognizing our shared humanity and demand that those people on the top stop fucking with us. Well, you know yeah, that's to do that, we also have, but I don't agree with everything you said, but to get to that place, we have to come together as a group. And, 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 and I'm not a pessimist ever, but I don't believe that we will ever achieve utopia we, we, we're, we're going to always have to battle those people that just will not understand because they because they're too selfish to care. And but when we come together as a group and they see us caring, then we change the standard. Right. And I think right. and I think you got to leave out those people. See, I would disagree with only one thing. You got to leave out the people who don't want to be there. You know, if Candace doesn't want to be uh, culturally identified with, and uh, one more thought is that. You know, one of the things that I believe allows black people to be in a unique position that I really like, and it's a similar position to Jesus, which was why I think King was so powerful. Look, the reality is power is this. Power is the ability to take your reality and make someone else make it theirs. The power power is taking creating a reality and making it someone else's, making someone else believe it as theirs. Think about it. White people have literally, white supremacy just creates a reality and then makes even black people operating them. So what we have to do, and that's why policy is so important. It's the, we are taking and creating a reality of suffering. And here's the point I was trying to make with about black people. Everybody who runs for president says, I was born out of hardship and I overcame it. There is nobody in this country who has a better test for a testimony of overcoming hardship than waking up every morning black in America. We are the answer for how you become fully human. We are the answer because we've struggled with people who don't want to let us be human. Back to your point, Brother Terry. <laughs> so we, right? we have what America's looking for. We have something for everybody. T tell us, Anna, what you got to say, Anna. That's right, Ray. Oh, okay, here's my deal. Speaking as a woman who just found out she's between 120 and 165 years old. <laughs> and looking fabulous. You know, black, well, yeah, black, black lives matter, but black time matters more to me. So I will challenge everyone. We've got six people on this panel and, you know, two people in production and stuff. I will challenge each person that is within the sound of my voice to take Three people. I don't care if they're, as my mother used to say, I don't care if they're purple. See, I would care if they were purple. But my mother would say, take three people that are in your, either, they are either in this part of your life or part of your peripheral vision and work with them. 
teach them, show them things, spend time. You know, I, there's no way I am going to affect, you know, 16 million people, black, white, green, purple, or otherwise. But I have three people that I can work with. And then if, if, they, if, if they come along and we get things going together, then they can get three more people. And this can happen within my lifetime where I can see change, where I can, you know, but I'm, I will plant a tree that I'll never sit, sit under. I don't have any problem with that. Right. But to, but, you know, to, you know, I mean, there, there's this guy that's, that's on YouTube now. He's all around the world because he picks up the trash in his community. This young guy goes around and he picks up trash and he talks to people. These are the things that we can do. You know, if you're, if you are up there and, you know, Terry, you're an attorney, you can affect this many people. I'm a little fat lady in sitting in uh, California. I can affect <laughs> this many people, you know, my son, maybe two of his friends. That's but I mean, there are things that, that I do, like I have my, my, my daughter, I have, I have, have one biological son. I've got 10,000 work kids and other children. I have two little girls. I actually have four little girls that I, I have taken an interest in them. They sell Girl Scout cookies. Here's some money for Girl Scout cookies. You know, I send them books. You know, they don't want to talk on the phone. I don't know what this thing about phones is. That's a whole nother thing. But <laughs> put in time. That's how you make your mark. It's that I can give you there's stuff that you can get from me that you can't get anywhere else in town mm -hmm. and the same for you so bring bring those people in and and I'm not saying get a whole bunch of people get three can you get three I, I totally agree with you and I think that you know we we saw the effect that Joshua had when he when he opened with his piece artists wonderful. artists have the the innate ability to reach masses what did they do in the ancient Greeks? They used theater to teach the community how to do, how to be social. And so as artists, we can use our voices and, and all the different talents that we have to teach the community how to be social. Sure. And that's something I try to do. And it's obvious that Joshua's doing it, but that, like, that's, do, that's taking the power that we have, the gifts that we have and using them for good. But that's what I'm saying. Let's let's do that. You that's know, because, true. Because yeah. A lot. There's a lot of time. Like this is a great time for anybody that has any kind of brains to to do something with themselves. You you don't you can't you don't even have to not read anymore. You can listen to audio if if you've got dyslexia. You can. There are so many things that that we have right now that that we can do to touch people to help people elevate themselves. You know, there's got to be a way some empathy, not sympathy. I don't want, you know, feeling sorry for people is a pussy move. Right. It really is. It's, it's just weak. Right. And it allows you to feel a little bit better than somebody else right. to have to have empathy for somebody to look at somebody and say, I can see myself in that position. Right. Or I, you know, you know, you never know where you're going to go. It's it's, you know, there's got to be a way to combine what you're talking about, one-on-one -on -one empathy with the systemic stuff that CB and Raymond and Joshua and Terry a little bit. I mean, when we think about it, Black people, what we've done in this country for voting rights, for housing rights, for everything, we have been on the forefront in history mm -hmm. of all of that. And what we've done and suffered, it fell out to bring those 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 protections to other groups there must be a way and but the problem is yes you know everybody can vote because you know we fought more you know right. everybody mm -hmm. housing rights even though we're on the losing side of it but in, in in many ways but because of some of those lawsuits others have been able women got their own bank, white women got their bank accounts because of the fights that we did. 
you know, right. I'm, I'm, this is what I'm talking about. Right. It's, it's two things. It's systemic and personal. It's but true. What I'm what saying, you, Pam, what, you know, here's what I'm saying. There's Terry, gotta be a way to bring it Terry, together. Ray, CB, to these, white these people see people it. Who are, who that's have what a matters. larger audience mm-hmm. than I do. What I can do is find my three people and get our stuff so tight that when, when Terry needs somebody to do something, if he needs something to be written, or if he needs, uh, you know, if he needs some sort of financial help, you know, I've got a jar full of pennies, you can have them. But we have to do, you know, we're, we're so busy trying to take care of the world. Let's take care of ourselves first. Taking care of ourselves is taking care of the world. That's, We've been doing it since absolutely, absolutely. It, no, then. no, there's a trickle up. There may right. not be a trickle down, but there is a trickle up. Ooh, I love that. I'm going to write that down right now. There's a trickle. There might not be yeah. a trickle down. Oh, so, I'm just going to yeah, be stealing I, I, that just so you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you're brilliant. I, I have some issues with the, with the empathy and, and want to move from empathy to compassion because I think we can have compassion for ourselves and others in ways that sometimes empathy allows Nazism to happen. But that's a whole other story for another day. And I would oh, love for us to continue this conversation it. on another day because we got some good stuff going here. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, I want to thank everybody for being here. Yeah, uh, yeah. And we're going to wrap up. We're going to take a photograph. Oh, right. Um, my earring back off. Oh, right. Did Rob try to tell us stop, stop, stop? <laughs> well, we, we were having a great conversation. So, I, you know, I think we were all <laughs> yeah, good. We're, we're 90 minutes into this. You guys were but, great. But it was awesome. But we have, we amazing. still have a 10 days. People are still out there and they're still sending <laughs> questions. Right? And it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Everybody that Terry, tuned in and, and stayed TV. with us, please come back. Raymond, oh. Anna, you guys were great. Especially those who challenged my thought. Great. This is and of course, you know, we all know. Joshua. For Joshua, oh, Joshua. I, I don't have my lighter. <laughs> Thank I you all my so much. We're gonna, this, Wonderful this is, to start. It. Oh, you, you got your lipstick? Here, I, yeah, I put on some new lipstick. Put on your lipstick, Josh. This is madness. <laughs> Anyways, um, do we need to pose? Tell. I'll oh, shut up. Oh, well, let's see. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank CB. I want to thank Pam. I want to thank Ray. I want to thank Anna. I want to thank Joshua. I want to thank Tur- Turbine Arts Collective and Rob out there for keeping us going with all this. And Rob, uh, is this picture is this good net for picture, Rob? Are we good? Oh, That's wait great. Minute, wait. Thank you all. Thank wait. you all so much. Oh, did you do we do it already? I think we're doing it now. Oh, <laughs> I got it. I got it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for being here with us.